Appalachia Rising. This is the podcast where we talk about great things happening in Appalachia that the story needs to get out. We think that the story is something that's important and it's a piece that we want to be able to share with the rest of the world and we like to tell it by the people who are doing the action themselves. So uh, welcome to this edition of the podcast. Today uh, we have someone who I've known for quite a while now and I really want to introduce to you. I think it's going to be a, a great chance to sit and hear his story and hear about what's taking place right here in eastern Kentucky. Jonathan Webb. No relation, at least not that we know of, uh, but he does sometimes call me his uncle, which is, uh, who knows. But uh, Jonathan, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Well, well Burton, thanks for inviting me on. Uh, we've been on this journey for, for a little while together. Uh, it's important uh, what you're doing here uh, with the podcast and, and appreciate you uh, uh, sitting down and taking some time with me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is one of those conversations that I knew when we first started this that I wanted to have because... Uh, so many good things are happening in Appalachia, and the stories that we have evolving here aren't being told. The story that's the dominant narrative that we hear over and over is about the opioid crisis and poverty, and, and we hear all those things, but gosh darn it, there are good things happening in Appalachia. So before we get into all that, I want to talk to you just a little bit about your background, because that's how we start all of these. So tell me a little bit about where you were born and raised and what, you, what your folks did and all that. Yeah, yeah, no, so I was, uh, was born here in Kentucky in, in, in the central part of the state. Uh, like a lot of people near the Lexington area, there are deep ties between uh, that part of the state and the eastern part of our state. Mm -hmm. uh, grandmother that grew up in Whitley County and uh, actually, when I was approached by some of the organizers for TEDx that they wanted to have TEDx in Corbin, uh, when I had heard that, uh, I think it was three minutes into the conversation, I was saying, how can I be helpful? we we got to make this happen because right. of it being in the Whitley County area where uh, where my grandmother was from. And, and uh, you know, I didn't really know some of this growing up. I was really kind of kind of just didn't, didn't really hear it. She didn't bring it up. Uh, but as I got older... Um, you know, heard the heard the stories the family you know heard that she had that 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 are stories of so many people in the region, uh, but but she had an unfortunate situation where uh, her her grand or her my great grandfather her father uh, passed away in a mining accident, mm -hmm. and she was uh, she was one two years old, and her and her sisters uh, you know that that deeply impacted impacted their life and growing up and. Uh, and, and, and what they had to deal with. And, and so always deep ties to the region. I have one, one sister, uh, it's a little older than me, and uh, I, I think a much better person. She, she's in foster care and uh, working in foster care here in the state. Uh, but, but she married a gentleman uh, who, whose father was uh, head of coal sales for a lot of the coal companies okay. in the region. And, and so when I got out of undergrad, I went to the University of Kentucky and mm -hmm. uh, love many of the universities in our I actually think that's something our state has to offer, which are these incredible institutions, uh, really from in, in, from Lexington to the eastern part of our into the eastern part of our state. Uh, but when I got out of undergrad, it was around 08, mm -hmm. right and, around the crash, and we all know the financial global crisis. Um, and I remember meeting with. Uh, with uh, Mr. Runyon at the time uh, and, and talking to him about potentially going into coal sales and didn't do it. Uh, moved to New York on my own uh, with no, no real relationships up there. Uh, remember Burton applying for, and I, I still have the trace of this, almost 150 jobs up there. Oh, isn't that crazy? I didn't get one interview. How about that? So I uh, moved up there working to get into wind and solar. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to build energy projects, but uh, at the time, and, and now even, you know, you're not going to build, it takes 20 years to build a nuclear facility. You're not going to, you know, we're not building coal plants. I wanted to build some some projects, and it, you know, what had been taking place 10 years ago was a lot of building on wind and solar. So so got into the industry and kind of just hustled my way in, really met developers, uh, uh, tried to help in any way I could on putting together uh, business plans or going to review uh, potential sites or working with utilities on their behalf. And through that work and being out of the state for almost 10 years, just saw the, the complete uh, separation between what was happening in the eastern part of our state with the coal industry and what was happening outside of the state uh, with all of this sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And whether we like it or don't like it is really irrelevant. It's just happening. 
and we have to find a way to collectively work together to capture some of that momentum and get that capital back to the region. So we'll talk more about App Harvest and what it's founded upon, but a basic principle was how do we capture these large, you know, sustainable dollars, bring them back to the region and just build projects. So in this case, we're building a, you know, indoor sustainable food facilities uh, right. to grow fruits and vegetables. But my, my background in the energy world uh, had a lot to do with kind of getting to this point. So before we jump into the, the, the greenhouse, because I do want to get to that, obviously, uh, let's talk just a little bit about the solar projects, because you built several solar mm -hmm. projects around the, the United States and mostly mm -hmm. on military bases. Is that right? Right. So after being in New York, I uh, had an opportunity, uh, got a phone call to, to move to D while I was going back and forth to D.C. Uh, to be a part of uh, a White House uh, initiative under the last administration, and that was to build energy projects on Army installations throughout okay. the U.S. Uh, was a part of leading 750 acres of solar at Fort Benning, Fort Stewart, and Fort Gordon uh, down in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, they were some of the largest solar projects at the time, uh, and that was an energy resiliency standpoint. Right. You know, have on-site generation, so if the grid goes down in any capacity, you know, that Army installation can still sustain and 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 keep operations going. Uh, so, but that work was very critical and being able to, to have the credibility to move back to the state and be able to build the, the, the first large project here with, with App Harvest. But you know, that, that background and being in that world, and again, uh, for me, it was very frustrating to see the divide right. between the stakeholders I was working with in that world and the lack of coordination with stakeholders back in our region, in our state. Uh, but we're starting to see that take place now, and I am very optimistic, but but I'm hopeful that, that that community that, you know, Burton, you, you know well, and you've been speaking at some conferences recently, mm -hmm. uh, very bright, uh, very compassionate, uh, but how do we work together to build? And how do we just focus on what we can do and build together versus, you know, let's not talk about our differences, not, let's not talk right. about, okay, what, what we think industries, uh, you know, long-term project, on the coal industry itself, Let, let's forget that and set that to the side and not even talk about it. Let's just talk about what we can build and do together. And, and I think right now that's been the important piece with all this is bringing people to the table from different backgrounds mm -hmm. to be able to just build and set our differences and leave them at the, ta leave them at the, at the door. Yeah, you know, when I think about what you do, Jonathan, I, I think you may have just hit on it. And, and it's facilitating conversations between folks who have means but don't necessarily, they want to do good. They don't necessarily know where it is that they should do the most good. And folks who have need and trying to figure out how we can not jump in and help, but how we can facilitate the things that they really want to get done uh, to make their lives better too. And so it, your story, it seems to me, is that thread of communication between those folks. Because it's what you did in the solar industry. You were involved with raising money to fund all those mm -hmm. projects. Yeah. And now that's really been at the heart of what you've done for the last 18 months in raising money to start with this project that we're going, going to talk about next. So let, let's jump into that just a little bit. Um, I think one of the unique things here is trying to, to leap over 35 or 40 years of development and push Eastern Kentucky right to the forefront of food production. Mm -hmm. So talk about the idea where did the idea come from? And then what we're doing now to start to move that forward? Yeah, I mean, Burton, that's, to me, one of the most exciting aspects of this. You, could, uh, you can build anywhere uh, around the world, uh, but again, I, I, I don't know, to me, something about place, this state being from here uh, is very important. Um, and I had this morning some community conversations with, with folks around here, and just the excitement around we're at the forefront, we're at the cutting edge. Not only are we building, are we developing, are we developing at scale, but we're at the forefront of leading an industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where, you know, Burton, we've said this since day one, and that's why my conversations with you early on were so important and, and appreciate, you know, the University of Pikeville uh, leading with us and, and look forward to that long-term relationship with mm -hmm. UPike. Uh, but it's not gonna be glass and steel structures that simply define this ecosystem. It's a big part of it, and the most critical part needs to needs to happen, which is projects need to be built. 
But as those projects are, are coming online and as this first project comes online, it is critical that we develop that ecosystem with high schools, with universities, uh, with our local government, uh, so that we can position ourselves to what I've continued to say, be the ag tech capital of the US. And there is no ag tech capital right now. Uh, a lot of people you know, circling this industry are saying, it's probably not gonna be in Boston, it probably won't be in New York City, and it probably won't be in San Francisco. So it's gonna right. be somewhere in the middle part of the country. Where is it gonna be? Let's grab it, let's take hold of it. And that's, what, that's the stakes that are on the table right now. Do we wanna to work together to develop an ecosystem to be the ag tech capital of America. It's on the table, we have the opportunity to do it, but it's gonna take leadership at all levels, uh, university presidents with, with local government, but uh, I, I'm hopeful and confident that this project, uh, as it starts to, to, to come to life, uh, will continue that momentum and, and bring stakeholders together. But, but yeah, being in this region and having the opportunity to lead an industry, uh, yeah, it's, it, it couldn't, I, I don't even think this is possible in many other parts of the U.S. I think our region wants it more. Mm -hmm. If you tried to do this in another state, uh, you have competing interests, you'll have uh, just a lot of different, uh, a lot of different voices that might guide one way or the other. I think right now we've got, we've got people leaning in and grabbing hold of this. If I talk to probably 200 people in the region, they would say this project doesn't happen without them. That's what it takes. It right. takes people being vested, vested for the long term and wanting to grab hold of this. And, and I do, I think our region has an opportunity. What that ends up being in five to 10 years, we'll see. Uh, but, but we definitely have an opportunity to lead an agriculture revolution in the U.S., which is desperately needed in the U.S. as, as our food system here is, is, is a bit of a house of cards. So Jonathan, I'm gonna spend some time now because this is what I've wanted to do with you for a long time. Let's talk about the vision in its biggest terms. Mm -hmm. When we talk about building an ecosystem, you and I know what that means, because I'm a biologist and, and you've lived in this for a while now. But let's, let's step back and talk about the big scale first, and then let's flesh out the ecosystem below it. Mm -hmm. So you and I have both been to the Netherlands, which is right now the best in the world. Describe in just a couple of sentences what it looks like in the Netherlands in the greenhouse ecosystem. Well, as Burton, as you know, it's hard to describe without setting <laughs> no, foot I gave on you a ground big task. over there. <laughs> but uh, I've tried to say the Netherlands is one third the size of Kentucky in landmass. You could fit the entire country into eastern Kentucky. Yeah. And they have the second most agricultural exports in the world, only behind the U.S. Yeah. Uh, they're growing with incredible efficiency, using very little resources. How are they doing that? They're doing that with controlled environment agriculture. They're growing indoors. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pre using precision technologies, sensors, software to optimize for the plant. You want to you want to get everything to the root, uh, all the nutrients and water directly to the root. You want to get maximum micromoles of lighting uh, to the plant. And as a result, you're getting 20, 30, 40 times yield per acre. Uh, so we're trying to take that. There's 10,000 companies in the Netherlands supporting this industry. So hang on, 10,000 companies supporting the greenhouse industry. Do you have any idea how much glass is under, or how much is under glass in the I, greenhouse? Actually, I, we've, we've got this number nailed down now. And in the we, Netherlands? We're talking okay. to it in DC about it. Again, a country a third the size of Kentucky in right. landmass has 10,000 acres of production. The entire United States with all of our legacy indoor grow facilities, and a lot of those can be just plastic hoop houses, we have a thousand acres in the U.S. So the U.S. should really have 20 to 30,000 right. acres of production. We have a thousand. The market opportunity in the U.S. is a 15, 20, 25 billion dollar opportunity to bring food production home, where we've seen imports from Mexico nearly tri triple the yeah. last 10 to 15 years. All of our food production, our specialty crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, berries, have moved, moved south of our border, mm -hmm. out of our country, pushed far southwest. So when we talk about the food system here being a house of cards, we're growing in regions where we have to truck 2,000 miles to get to the major markets on the East Coast. We're growing in drought-stricken regions where water is running out in California and Arizona, Colorado rivers drying up, parts of Mexico drying up. We can bring that production more regionalized. We can grow it closer to where it's being consumed, and we're going to have to do it through controlled ag. And so the ecosystem concept is take the ecosystem in the Netherlands from 
all of the supporting companies, to the universities, to the high schools, bring that over here at scale. So when you say at scale, what we're looking at, this first facility in, in Moorhead, Kentucky, uh, is 60 acres under glass. 60 acres, 10,000 acres. Does anybody do the math? Because that's enormous. It's this enormous. Is, this is the biggest greenhouse in the United States, right? Connected under roof, it's, it's one of the largest. One of the, the largest world. in the world, 60 acres. And it is not even a percent of what we need to build in this region. I'm just trying to set the vision for this is an explosive industry. This is something that's exciting that could be transformative for Eastern Kentucky, Southern Ohio, this whole region, yeah. if we catch this vision. Yeah. So getting a hold of what that looks like is the first step. Then we can jump into the ecosystem. Yeah, so, and you're right, and to ha hammer on that, and I've tried to talk to policymakers, lawmakers, we've spent a lot of time in D.C., I've uh, been, been at the White House a few times, we've uh, you know, talked to our congressional and, and, and Senate delegation here in the, in the state of Kentucky. Again, when we say our state has the ability to lead this industry, that ecosystem, we're buying all of our stuff from the Netherlands. So the mm -hmm. reason I just came over there right. is our lighting is coming from the Netherlands. All of our components, the steel, the glass, everything being manufactured and fabricated is over there. All of the companies supporting the industry are there. So those 600 semi-trucks of stuff yeah. are coming from the Netherlands, going to Rotterdam, coming to Port of Norfolk, Norfolk trained to Louisville, Louisville semi-truck to here. Why don't we, why don't we manufacture some of that stuff here? Right. And so we can over time, and, and that ecosystem is how do we get some of those large suppliers and different companies in the U.S. If we want to see the industry take off at scale, not just in our region, but in the U.S., we're going to have to build many of these products here in the U.S. in order right. to drive the industry. Uh, so again, you know, big vision. We're not only building the We've made it very clear. We want to build the largest indoor sustainable produce hub in America. We want it to be here in central Appalachia and, and, and a majority of that in eastern Kentucky. But it's going to take a lot around that in order to make that happen. Universities who are working to, again, as you know, Burton, we have to bring in our head growers from outside the region. Right. We have to bring in our general managers. We have to bring in our many of our technicians. That, 30% of the top talent to kind of run the greenhouse has to be developed through different various training programs, whether it be through universities or community colleges. Uh, so again, that ecosystem is talent, uh, learning how, how to grow with technology. Uh, part of it is actually bringing the manufacturers and suppliers over to our region, and again, developing this entire ecosystem that would support and drive growth over, over time. Right, now let, let's, let's dig into the ecosystem a little, because I know the college and university component, that's, that's my bit, but uh, there are parts of it that I'm not even totally familiar with that I heard a little bit about when we were in the Netherlands the last time. In the greenhouse, typically greenhouse growers of things like tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers don't grow their plants from seedlings. That seed production, or the, the planting and germination is done somewhere else. Seed harvesting and seed preparation is typically done somewhere else. Uh, preparing the medium that you grow them in, the little blocks of foam or whatever it is that you choose to, to grow the plants in, is done somewhere else. Preparing all the fertilizers and getting the mixes into the right places is done somewhere else. So I'm, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for all these ancillary support businesses that have to happen because Sometimes we get caught up in the idea that, you know, Toyota is the next big thing and we got to have a Toyota plant because they got parts that have to be manufactured. Well, for crying out loud, there are parts that have to be manufactured for greenhouses too. Mm -hmm. So it's that whole thing that you're talking about, right? It's, it's massive. Yeah. Um, there's, again, 10,000 companies. You did a great job of describing just on the operation day-to-day -day side. Uh, yeah, you have seed companies. You have uh, propagators that are taking the seeds and, and developing them into small plants. Uh, those are then being uh, shipped into the greenhouse. Uh, you have uh, your, your growing medium, uh, all operationally oriented. Then you have, again, the suppliers that are actually making all the stuff to build the greenhouse. So whether it be lighting, whether it be sensors, uh, whether it be steel, glass, aluminum, uh, a lot of that can be fabricated here. Uh, of course, we have incredible welders in, in the eastern part of oh, our yeah. state. We yeah. have incredible craftsmen uh, that, that are, that again, this is going to take, 
you know, it's going to take a lot of people working together if we want to create this vision for the region together. You know, we're, we're going to build some greenhouses. App Harvest, is, it, we'll, we'll grow a good amount of vegetables and supply them and you know, export them out to the major states in the U.S. Uh, but again, do we want to develop this ecosystem? Because if we do, it's going to take a lot more than one or two companies working on that. Uh, and it's going to take collaboration at many levels. Uh, so on the operating side, there's a layer to the business. On the building side, there's a layer. And on the talent to be able to stand up and run right. the, the facility itself. And Burton, actually, I would ask you, after you've been to the Netherlands three times, mm -hmm. so what was your take on, on some of the needs for, for on the university side? I know your university's looked at this heavily, and, and we're working together, and uh, we'll continue to, to pursue yeah. that track. But what are some of those needs that you saw on the top end? So, because I'm the only one uh, <laughs> kind of kind of running around the state trying to talk through this, but yeah, I but, have a full time job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got a, you've got a full time job. But there are some things because you know, starting with the, the simplest things like how to run the day to day operations of the greenhouse, uh, simple things like pruning the plants and making sure that they're healthy and watching the microbiome of the whole greenhouse to make sure fungi don't grow too quickly or bacteria grow too quickly. I mean, those are simple operational things that we need to train an army of people to do to keep track of. But then making sure that the mix of the fertilizers, that the temperature is appropriate, the amount of light is appropriate, uh, this whole thing goes up into the assistant grower and the grower level and building out that ecosystem is just part of operation. Then you step back from that and you think, well, how do you grow plants at this kind of scale with this kind of density in a way that you don't have to use pesticides and herbicides on everything? Well, that leads to an entire layer of research about what are the, what are the bugs we're going to have to face here, because they'll be different from the Netherlands. We looked at a technology when we were over there the last time that used micro drones. Do you remember this? Micro drones that are this big, they, they're on a little landing pad, and when one of the pathogens flies by, a moth, this thing takes off and clips the wings off of it and comes back and lands. It's it's remarkable. I mean, it's it's I, like it's having an insect so, that's a killer yeah, insect. So in what there. we've tried, yeah, <laughs> what what we've tried to do with this facility mm -hmm. is take technology and align it with natural systems as right. best as possible. So uh, the ongoing research needed to do that is critical in, frankly, holding all of our feet to the fire and going, how can we do this better? Right. Uh, so this facility, with it with it being sixty acres under glass, we're the glass allows us to still capture the sunlight. Uh, also, we're building a 10 acre retention pond to where we're collecting all the rainwater on the roof, mm -hmm. filtering that back into the greenhouse to where we're running the facility completely on recycled rainwater. Again, why is that important? Long term, taking our destiny into our own hands in the sense of not being reliant on city water. Look at what happened in Flint, Michigan. Look yeah, at what happened yeah. right now in Martin County, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good for the community. It's good for us to really not be reliant on city water. Uh, and then also because of that, we take, there's sodium in groundwater. When you're running a system completely from rainwater, there's no sodium in the rain. You don't have the sodium buildup in the hydroponic system. So we're growing hydroponically. With that, we will not have agricultural runoff because we won't need to flush the system. Right. So everything stays in the greenhouse. Again, just, from a systems engineering standpoint, how do we design this system to capture the sunlight, capture the rainwater, then use technology on top? So that's where we are adding in the LEDs. This will be the largest LED installation. Uh, we're using software and sensors to predict, see where the and what's going on with the climate outside so we can change the temperature, change the lighting settings on the inside to again optimize for the plant. The medium to long term on this, though, is what you're talking about, Burton, and that is these different technologies where you know, robots can go through the greenhouse, scan the plant, see if there's one pest, and if there's one pest, get the plant out of the greenhouse immediately right. before those pests or virus spread. Uh, there's, from a biologic standpoint, we won't be using harsh chemical pesticides. We'll be using good pests to kill the bad pests. So again, what are other companies in the region that could pop up? Companies that are supplying us with good insects right. that we put it, introduce into the greenhouse to kill the bad insects. We're using 
uh, bees to naturally pollinate the plants. Bumblebees, right? Bumblebees. Yeah. So again, all of these different ancillary businesses uh, that will be critical in the long-term operation of, of, of these types of facilities. That's great news. I think that's great news for Eastern Kentucky. We're going to take a break right now. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes and talk a little bit more about App Harvest. You're listening to Appalachia Rising. You're listening to Appalachia Rising, presented by the University of Pikeville. Welcome back to Appalachia Rising. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm going to, I'm going to phrase it in a, a, a kind of an odd way. So the last time I was in the Netherlands was May, I think, and uh, I got the opportunity to go to a seed company, and they had at their facility 20 or 30 varieties of tomatoes and 20 or 30 varieties of peppers and cucumbers and all that kind of stuff. And I got to tell you, I'm used to going to to Food City and buying either red peppers or green peppers. I did not realize there were 30 different varieties of peppers, some of which taste like apples. I had no idea. I had no idea the varieties that are out there. So I want you to talk about the varieties that you're going to grow here and just a little bit about them. And, uh, and then let's talk about what's possible inside of a greenhouse. Yeah, again, Burton, um, you know, you being a fearless leader and your willingness to go with us early on to the Netherlands. Uh, it's hard to describe much of this because when you're over there and you feel it, you see it, you taste it, uh, it's, it's different. Um, and not only are we, are we bringing production home, do we want to more regionalize it, take it, take production that's moved south of our border and bring it home. It is a far better quality product. Uh, you're picking and getting on the shelf almost the same day Obviously, uh, I'm a big proponent of, of, uh, of vegetables. I, I eat a lot of vegetables myself, and I, and I think probably one of the best places you can get them is, is uh, your family's backyard or, or picking it right off the vine. Just shy of that, I would say this is about as good as you're going to get. Yep. Uh, and in many cases, uh, could rival or beat uh, anything you're growing in, in your backyard. And, and quality is very important if... if you know, right now, a uh, CDC report that one in 10 Americans eat enough fruits and vegetables. And part of that, you know, part of the reasoning, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of conversations on this, is who, who wants to eat this stuff? I mean, you've got tomatoes that are sitting five days on a truck. They're picked green. They're sprayed with chemicals to ripen and turn red. Uh, they show up. They're hard. Some of them you could just throw on the ground and bounce. Uh, and that's supposed to be, you know, a... a something you're gonna you're gonna get a young person to eat no not a chance uh, so for us quality is critically important and the quality of the varieties that that are grown inside of the greenhouse it's it's as good as you get they're plump they're juicy they're red uh, so we will be growing tomatoes uh, one reason main reason why is that's the number one import from Mexico right uh, four billion pounds of tomatoes so again when we talk about scale and size we're gonna do roughly 50 million pounds of produce a year we're going to grow tomatoes and cucumbers. Tomatoes alone import from one country last year, 4 billion pounds of tomatoes from Mexico. So again, 4 billion pounds of just tomatoes coming mm -hmm. out of Mexico last year. We'll do 50 million pounds of tomatoes and cucumbers. That's a small fraction of the imports of one product from right. one country. Uh, so again, at scale, how do we bring this home? But taste is critically important yeah. and the taste of of all the different products that, that we can grow so that these types of facilities that the first one we're building here could grow any vine crop so any any tomato any cucumber any pepper a similar type system uh, can grow berries so strawberries are, are a big one i mean right now you go to the grocery store your strawberries are sitting five days from california right half of them are moldy when you buy them the, the other, other half, half are white. The other half are white or moldy <laughs> a day or two later. Uh, it's just that that's not the way strawberries taste. You go in these facilities, you take a you take a taste of a strawberry right off the vine. Uh, it's sugary. Uh, it's vibrant. It's fresh. You could snack on it like anything else versus, you know, what you're getting in, in unfortunately, uh, shipped five days right now. So uh, leafy greens are something else that that uh, and again, uh, the leafy. I, I wanted to mention this that, that the uh, the wonderful uh, 
wonderful relationship with Shelby Valley High School. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where we have put uh, a shipping container. So think of a very, very, very small scale on what we're doing here, which is uh, lighting, sensors, software. You can operate that unit from an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, we've got roughly 30 students that have just taken it over, brought it to life. Mm -hmm. We intentionally did not want a head grower to operate it. Uh, we put some entry level folks in uh, that, that have not operated that type of facility before. Right. We wanted the students to bring it to life and they did. And uh, one of the, the gentlemen that has been working with us that, that you've met throughout the process uh, went to uh, Pike County, went and looked at the container, said, hey, if, if students can operate this, they have 50, 60% of the skills they would need to, to transcend, transcend up to a larger facility. Mm -hmm. So again, just in, in our position, our take is this, if one in 10 Americans are eating enough fruits and vegetables, how do, we, how do we scale that number up to two in 10 or three in 10, which would double or triple the U.S. demand, which right. is insane, right? There, there wouldn't be enough supply to even come close to, to fill that. And that should be an, a number we need to get to from a health standpoint right. that you know as well as, as anybody, you're, you've been working with Pikeville Medical Center and others on kind of health and wellness. How do we talk and teach agriculture and farming with modern technology at high schools all across our region frankly all across the country i mean this is flatly unacceptable that we're not grow people are not we're not growing in school you know this should just be commonplace so we hope that this program at shelby valley high school and and it's more than a hope we're working on it very aggressively to roll that out to other high schools we are hopeful that the federal government and others will look at this and go hey, how do we infuse technology and get what you saw, right. which is the LED lights and software and different technologies in classrooms all across the region growing, putting those vegetables in the school lunch, letting kids send them, take, them, let, take right. the vegetables home at night, uh, but it, and then also building that culture of what we see in the Netherlands. You go to a high school in the Netherlands, People talk about wanting to be doctors. They talk about wanting to be lawyers. They talk about wanting to be farmers. Exactly. No farms, no food, and no one in this country. If you go to a high school, you tell me one kid you walk up to that says, when I get out of high school, I want to be a farmer. Doesn't happen. Right. And the average age of the farmer in the U.S. right now is mid to late 60s. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? So if we do not infuse technology into these high schools, we don't create some type of excitement around farming, where are we all going? Right. And, and so for us, we think it's critical, uh, medium to long term, uh, to, really, to really bring some of this into the classroom and let the students be champions for this, not right. just us. Have them thinking, what can we do together to build this ecosystem? Uh, and so for us, it's been very important at Shelby Valley High School and also just allowing people to taste what some of, this, what some of the produce tastes like. So, so again, at the end of it, uh, taste is going to be critically important. Uh, as we go on store shelves, and we're very confident that, that the consumers will, will pick, uh, pick the, the, the locally grown, regionally grown produce here versus the produce coming five days from the other direction. Well, it just tastes better. And, and fundamentally, I think that might be it. Maybe that's part of the, the process of closing the loop is making sure that in high schools and in colleges and other places, people learn how to prep food properly. Mm -hmm. Because so much of what we do now is just what our parents have done before us, and a lot of how we cook food takes a lot of the flavor out of it. And so maybe closing that loop is an important component of this too. I should add just though, so we have full disclosure, that you and I have a, we have a common grant that we've been working mm -hmm. on that builds curriculum from the high school level all the way up through the college level. And I think we're talking about nine containers right now. That's the, the grant, the second grant that we've got out. Is that correct? Well, you know, Burton, I've, we've set the stake and we want to be at 20 high schools. Okay. However long that takes us to get there, it takes us to get there. Good. We're at one right now. Uh, if we're at four or five more in the you know, coming year, great. Uh, but we want to be at 20 and then keep rolling from there. Right. Uh, and obviously, I think the early conversations with you, uh, part of part of the alignment early on was just the overall vision of how you saw health and wellness. Right. And some of your thoughts for even the campus at the University of Pikeville of mm -hmm. potentially building uh, indoor grow operations on top of campus buildings. This just has to naturally happen, uh, period, across the country if, if we're gonna get to where we need to be to, to have more fresh available. I, I recently 
have been saying and, and have said from early on that it is very frustrating to me that it is some type of, this could be a little controversial, but some type of elite mindset that it's that person that has the ability to go to a Whole Foods to buy fresh fruits and vegetables for their family. That's flatly unacceptable. Yeah. So how do we make it affordable to where good, fresh, healthy food is available uh, and available to all consumers? Uh, so again, we're gonna have to do that through building, growing at home, growing at scale, getting prices down. We get our prices down through uh, reducing trucking from exactly. five days to, to a day. Uh, but again, we, you know, ideally we're at a place in the not so distant future where we have much more available uh, fresh, good, healthy fruits and vegetables. Uh, because right now, the, you know, you're, you're seeing it at just you know, select grocers or you know, the, the high prices and, and, and families, they, they've got to choose. I mean, what, you, you've got a limited amount of choices you can make with your dollar. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the one thing everybody votes with. People talk about voting at the polls. You vote with your dollar every day. You vote at the grocery store. You vote wherever you buy stuff. Right. And th those dollars are important, and, and there's only so many to, to go out at every, every month. And, and so for us, long term, we've just got to make sure we're keeping prices down uh, and, and we make good, high-quality, fresh, available food uh, at, at prices that are, that are competing right now with conventional. But to do that, again, we have to have scale. That's why this first project people have asked since day one, why the heck didn't you just build an acre and then scale up? Yeah. Uh, part of the reason is we have to build at scale to get our materials costs down, to get our operating costs down so that we can compete with conventional. Uh, if we want everyday uh, uh, Americans to buy you know, and pick American produce over the imports, it's gonna have to be at the same or lower pricing. Uh, so for us, again, long-term, uh, it's, it's just very important, important that this is, this is a, you know, we're trying to sell to the 90, 95% of the US market, not the niche, five percent at the top uh yet we want to have you know niche high-end great quality produce that's just available at, at conventional pricing so one of the things we learned in the netherlands which is interesting is there are some food products that can be grown in much smaller facilities and done in large volumes i'm thinking of the lettuce facility that we visited talk a little bit about that because i know that's in your landscape your long your long-term plan as well what about non-vine products? Yeah, so leafy greens, uh, a, a critical component to this. There's a couple, you know, people in this region know about our efforts, but if you're in New York City, uh, there's Bowery, who recently got, I think, uh, raised $100 million from Google. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Plenty in San Francisco. Uh, they raised $200 million from uh, Jeff Bezos, helped lead the round with SoftBank. Uh, they're growing, they're focusing on leafy greens. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this, and there's a lot of different ways we could be doing it in our region, mm -hmm. uh, and we're aggressively looking at all of that right now. We've, we, we, again, if you're in D.C., before when I lived in D.C. before coming back to Kentucky, if I went and bought lettuce, I'm my dollar, about 80 cents of that dollar, is going towards fuel to get the lettuce from California right. to D.C. About 20 to 25 cents was actually going towards the lettuce itself. To the so I'm, I'm buying gasoline with a little bit of lettuce. That's completely screwed up. So again, from an environmental perspective, how do we get the food miles down? Uh, from a cost perspective, it could cost us more to grow it indoors. But again, if it's costing us a little more and we're cutting that transportation cost, then we can get it to the consumer at the same price. So uh, leafy greens are something that, that again, are naturally going to come indoors over time. We're going to see uh, see facilities being built like Plenty and Bowery are doing in big big cities indoors across the country. Uh, that 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 will happen here in in our region as well. Yeah. Uh, but but it's not the number one focus for us right now. No, sure, it's not your focus at this point. I'm just thinking of the varieties that might be out there. And if I remember the facility correctly, uh, it was about a two acre facility and produced about two million pounds of lettuce annually, give or take. Uh, pretty amazing system of seedlings in the back and then coming all the way up to the front and then just pulling them off and sending them out to the stores. And 
Uh, couldn't be any more fresh than that. So great system, great ecosystem. These are these are beautiful facilities that, that again, you can only really capture it all once you walk inside of it. But I really look forward to Burton having you inside of this facility, having stakeholders from communities around here so we can walk in, see the facility, and then start brainstorming what's next, what's That's next right. for our region. Uh, but it's going to be important because you've been in and out of the facilities, but you can't really capture uh, capture what it's like. I, I've tried to say uh, to even my family who's who's not, not, not been around any of these facilities, it's just heavenly. It's heavenly. Uh, you know, millions, millions of pounds of, of fresh vegetables being grown without chemicals uh, in a good, clean environment, uh, and, and look forward to having you inside of this one. So here's the last question, and it's kind of a big one because it's rainy today. When are we going to see this greenhouse up and running? Yeah, well, weather permitting, we sure are, we have to say that <laughs> we, we we're 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 on full swing uh, under construction. Uh, we'll be we'll be uh, in full production by the mid part of 2020. Uh, you'll see about half of the greenhouse steel up before the around the end of this year. Uh, by the spring of 2020, uh, you'll see most all the structure up, and then we'll be completing it going into the summer next year. So uh, we're it's one of the one of the larger earthwork projects in North America right now, uh, and we're uh, aggressively moving at rapid speed over the coming months. So as you drive up and down the road out here, you'll see a lot of activity over the coming months. That sounds good. Well, we're going to take a, a break, and we're going to go out and visit the greenhouse facility. Not a whole lot to see yet, and it's kind of a rainy, muddy day, but if you stay with uh, Appalachia Rising, we'll give you updates over the course of the next couple years, and I assume we'll be invited back to walk through the greenhouse when it's all said and done. Burton, you all are welcome anytime. All right, that sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Appalachia Rising. For more information on this episode or others, visit www.upike.edu forward slash Appalachia Rising.